Hello, um, second mini lecture this week is going to look at the basics of feedback control. So far, what we've looked at is the dynamics of systems, how to characterize them, how to look at how they change, how they change in response to different inputs, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but we've not done anything about control yet. So now we're gonna start that journey. I'm gonna do a couple lectures and Dr. Professor Costas will carry on next week. So we're gonna look through the slides for a little bit. This is what we've been talking about. This is the open system. So it's a system with no control. And we're familiar with all these aspects now. We've got the process that we can characterize. We've got manipulated variables. So these are things that we control and we can change to adjust the process. We've got disturbances. So these are the things that we aren't controlling but we have to accommodate a change in flow rate that we didn't plan, something like that. And then these are the outputs. The outputs are the things that we know that we want um, and that we want to uh, control and get to a certain point. So the question is how can we get what we want for the outputs by manipulating these inputs that we have available to us. And that's the feedback control system that we're going to use. There are other types of control system too. Feedback control makes up uh, the majority of control systems. We're starting with that one. Professor Costas will look at some other ones with you. Basic steps in this process. First of all, we need to measure our output. So we're going to have some instrumentation, a transducer that enables us to turn the output that we want to measure into some sort of signal. We then want to compare the measurement with the desired level. So we need a comparator so that we can say what our chosen set point is and then that can be compared to the measured output and that will create a signal which we call the error signal. So the error signal is the driving force for the controller because this tells us how far we are away from where we want to be. So the bigger the error signal the more the controller needs to do. So we need to then assess the error and decide the action. So that's the controller. Based on what the error is, it has a number of um, functions that will uh, decide what to do. And we can design the controller and build the controller to behave in different ways. And that needs to be coupled to the process to get the overall system response that we want. So then finally, Stage five is to activate the devices to apply the changes. So the controller's decided what needs to happen to make the difference, and now we need a device to do that. So the controller sends out a signal which will change a valve, for example, uh, to affect a flow rate, uh, could adjust the heating input into something, something like that. So there's another uh, device that would be an actuator that uh, makes a change to some aspect of the process. So five basic steps which will enable us to follow a control path. Uh, and so we can look at these on our process schematic to see how we uh, add them together and how this forms the control loop. So starting here, we've got the process, that's what we're interested in. Uh, the process has got the disturbance entering it and it's got uh, controlled variables, M, coming into it. Uh, and obviously we've got the output coming out. We measure the output and something uh, comes out of that. We call that Y tilde. So this isn't the same as Y because we don't know exactly what the output is. We have to measure it. And whenever we measure something, we don't know exactly what it is. We are estimating it uh, and that's subject to um, inaccuracies and uh, its own problems. And the measuring device will have its own response as well. We discussed before how that can be a second order response if it's got moving parts within there. It could be a second order response, it could be a first order response. It could be thermocouples, uh, it could be diaphragms, orifice plates, gas chromatographs, all sorts of things. Any measuring device will have its own transfer function. And that gives us our estimate for what Y is. Here are some examples of industrial measuring devices. On the left is a differential pressure transducer. So that will have two tubes attached to it and it will measure the pressure difference between the two and it can then send that signal on to a control station 
uh, that will uh, uh, input it into its calculations. Um, here's another one, temperature transmitter. So we've done the measurement, our signal Y tilde comes out of that, and we want to see how it is. We've got a desired set point, so we put that in YSP, SP stands for set point. That's what we want to be getting at the outlet of our process, so that's what we're getting at the outlet Y, YSP, that's what we'd like it to be. So we can decide how we want the process to be behaving and what we want to be coming, what we want to have coming out of it. So we compare that to what we are getting coming out of it, and the difference will be the error, or an estimate of the error, since y tilde is not the same as y. But that's our best estimate of the error. And that's what we're going to send on to the controller. So if y tilde is the same as y sp, then the difference between them is zero. And there's no action needed if the difference is zero. Um, but it's when there is an error, then some actions required. So we need to add the controller into this system. The controller's here, it takes the error, it has a transfer function GC, uh, and then we get a signal out of it, delta C, which is telling us what to do. So delta C is equal to GC times epsilon, so there's a transfer function, uh, and it's the characteristics of that transfer function that we're going to choose and design tune the parameters to make it work the way we want it to. Uh, perhaps the simplest controller, our starting point is a proportional controller. So this takes the error and multiplies it, simply multiplies it by a coefficient, and that's the signal um, to the actuator for what to change. So that basically means the bigger the error, the more the response. But in general, we can add different things into that type of response to make it behave different ways. So now we close the loop, we've measured, we've compared, we've used the controller to decide what to do, and then our signal delta C needs to go into some sort of actuator. So here we have a valve, and so the valve is then going to adjust our input M. So M could be a flow rate, it could be like a cooling water flow rate, and our actuator will adjust the flow rate of that. So if our output is too hot, this measures the temperature coming out, it's too hot, so we have an error and the error is positive, saying it's too hot. So then this says we need to open up the valve, so we send a signal to the valve, open the valve, uh, then the cooling water flow rate would increase, and then that would tend to decrease Y. So we have a closed loop which allows that information to flow around and to be processed. So the measuring device and the valve, all these things have their own dynamics. So we discussed the measuring device, and likewise the valve has a transfer function associated with it. And these would all contribute together, they'd all add together and contribute to the, um, to the final operation. Uh, the controller then adds um, degrees of freedom to exploit. This will have parameters in it which we get to choose. So then we can fine tune the response. First of all, we choose the type of controller, and then once we've chosen the type, that will have a number of parameters that we can then tune to make the whole process behave the best way that we can get it to. Here are some valves. So this is what your controller would then send a signal to. The signal will come into this control valve. Uh, this looks like uh, some sort of pneumatic line, which is then uh, adjusting the flow rate um, uh, by making a valve open or close. So we mentioned some choices of controller. We saw this one just momentarily ago. This is the proportional controller, the simplest one. And we reason that, well, the bigger the error, the more we need to do, the bigger the adjustment we need to make. And then hopefully that will make the error go back down and then our adjustment can go back down. So here is the proportional controller that has a transfer function simply where the response is proportional to the error. Two other types which add functionality, proportional integral. So we add on an integral term, and this is integrating the error over time. And then the third one is proportional integral differential, which you might have heard as a PID controller. It has three elements. It has an element for the integral, an element now for the differential. So that looks at the rate of change of error. And it has a term for the 
proportional response to the error. And these will all enable the response to change uh, in slightly different ways. Obviously, the bigger the error, the more response we want. So that's generally what the proportional component does. The differential component, well, if the error is changing very quickly, if the error is, uh, if the system is going wrong very quickly, we want to respond quickly too. So this enables the controller to respond more quickly uh, if we have a case where the system is, the process is moving away from the set point quickly. If the system's moving away from the set point slowly, then this is a lower value and the controller doesn't have to respond as quickly. So it can give rise to some smoother control and it can give rise to quick control when it's needed. Then the integral, that will take account of any persistent errors. So if you have a set point uh, offset, so if your controller can lead to an offset between your chosen set point and the actual output you're getting, uh, if that's uh, an occurrence, then the integral controller will get rid of that. So this will um, start to become significant if the error is can, might only be a little bit different from the set point, but if that's persisting, then the integral term will start getting large, and then this enables us to account for that fact and then make an adjustment to reduce down that uh, 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 offset. So you can see that with these, we've got some different choices, and that each one comes with its own parameter the Ki for the integral part, Kd for the differential part, and Kc for the um, proportional part. And so you've got those three parameters to tune for any, uh, for any given PID controller to get the response that you want out of it. So the dynamics of the closed system, each part of it has its own transfer function. The process we've seen it has a transfer function Gp, uh, and then we're giving a transfer function Gd to the um, disturbance that uh, is affecting that process. The measuring device has its own transfer function GM. The comparator simply has a transfer function of one. The control system is GC, and then the valve is GV. So V is for valve, C is for control system, M is for measuring device, P is for process, and D is disturbance. So we've got quite a few different things going on, but now we have a system where we can integrate all those together. So this is uh, what our system now looks like, where we've inputted the terms that we've identified. YSP is a set point, Y is the output, Y tilde is our estimate of the output via the measurement, D is the disturbance, there's our error, which gets turned into the control signal, which gets turned into the change in process input, and then that's our process, which will respond. Each of these obviously can be linked to the uh, ones before and after it. So G, uh, sorry, Y, the output is going to be equal to, okay, so it's going to be M times GP. So it's that signal, that input going into that process. And it's going to be that signal D going into that process, that transfer function. So we add those together. And you can see out of each transfer function, you get that. So Y tilde is GM times YS. Epsilon is YSP minus ys, that's the comparator, and so on. So obviously now we've got to that point and we want to solve for ys so that we can see how our overall system behaves. Um, and that's what we've got on this slide. I'll just work through that for you to make sure that's clear. So we can look at our output y. We know that's gp times m plus gd times d. We've got those two terms there added together. Okay, well of course we can see what m is. m is equal to gv times delta c. And so those two bits can be added together, which you can see there. Uh, when you bring these two equations together, then obviously substitute in for m. Then y equals gp gv delta c plus gd d. And you carry on going around the loop. You add in delta c is equal to gc epsilon. You add in epsilon is equal to ysp minus y tilde. And then we can write that y is equal to gp gv gc. 
So that's the, three, the product of those three, three transfer functions multiplied by the epsilon ysp minus y tilde. So multiplied by that signal plus gdd. And that tells us what comes out. But what's y tilde? Here's the feedback loop. y tilde is gm times y gm times y, so we can substitute in for that to get this whole term uh, as a function of y. So here we have y is equal gp, gv, gc, multiplied by y sp minus gmy plus gdd. So you can see where we're going. We can try and group the y's together. So we've taken those to the left, left the other stuff on the right hand side, and then we can take the y out, you can see that then we need to divide by this term to get a function for y. So we do that and we get y is equal to gp, gv, gc divided by 1 plus gp, gv, gc, gm y times sp plus this term gd over 1 plus gp, gv, gc, gm multiplied by d. It's all a bit of a mouthful but I think you can see what's going on. So y is the sum of two terms. We recognize these as being transfer functions. And there are two transfer functions which are relating to different parts of the process. So this part here is what we call servo control. So servo control is about when we decide that the output of the process should change. So if we want to change YSP, then we can do that, and that's change the set point, and then the process will have to respond to try and achieve that new set point, and it will respond according to this transfer function here. This one is called regulatory control, and this is about regulating the process to um, accommodate disturbances. So D is our disturbance. So this transfer function will control how the process responds to a disturbance. Obviously we want it to respond quickly to eliminate that disturbance. Likewise here we want it to respond quickly to get to our new set point. We want it to be stable and we want it to work as uh, efficiently as possible. We also have to account for the other aspects of the process uh, which are out with control. So we want it to respond well in its transient behavior um, and we want to make the process as economical and straightforward to build as well. So we'll pause this lecture here and in the final mini lecture we'll talk through some of the features of this control system that we've designed uh, in more detail. Thank you.